and we are now recording. Okay. Uh, hello and welcome to the Amherst meeting of the Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee, <clears throat> which was organized to guide the town meeting in its climate mitigation and resilience goals. Um, those goals and the plan for getting there are adopted from the Climate Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan or the CARP, which was accepted by the town council in 2021. It takes 2016 as its base year and calls for a 25% reduction in carbon emissions by 2025, 50% by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2050. So this committee has two primary functions. One is to advise the town council and recommend or propose policies or actions that help us meet those goals. And the other is to promote a just, equitable and speedy climate response through outreach and engagement of town and local stakeholders. So welcome. Um, <clears throat> the first thing on the agenda is always to find a note taker. Um, so let's see, where are we with note takers? Um, I'm trying to look. Michael for... did it last time. Who's next on the list? You have the. Um, let's see. Yeah. I don't know if it's in order. Uh, I mean, assuming this list order doesn't change. <laughs> if it does. It shouldn't, it but does. I think it does sometimes. <laughs> so then we have yeah. uh, Don, uh, who's not here yet, and then Tony. Don, Don and Tony will not be here this evening. Okay. Can I don't. Oh, Haven't yes. heard from Caitlin. Um, Andrew, you want to give it a try? Sure. I will do my meeting. best. It's only a second meeting, so I feel like it's a little unfair. But uh, this is my third meeting, third so meeting. maybe fine. it's fine. Okay. It's fine <laughs> I, I'll I'll do my best. Okay. So Andrew, you can just send me the draft when you're done. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the next thing we do is share the minutes to approve the minutes from the last meeting, which I have here. Um, <clears throat> so very nice to the point minutes. And this is really all you need in minutes. It's sort of a list of things we discussed. <laughs> it doesn't need to be a lot of detail. I didn't find anything <coughs> um, that I think needed changing but Lori I don't know if you can hear us but you froze Froze. you Am did froze? oh dear Am I you're okay? back but you're good yeah my internet has been a little flaky lately um I hope I don't disappear if I disappear oh we need a we need us a, a um a vice chair. <laughs> we should put that on the agenda for next time or maybe talk about it at the end today if we have if we have time. Um, Lori, you're breaking up. Um, oh dear. I don't know what to do about that. Do you want me to me share see. the minutes? Maybe it'll be easier if I do that. Why don't you let me, yeah, okay. Yep, I'll unshare, you go and share. Let me stop. Give me a second, I have to get them up again. Try that. I think we might not need to bring them up. Do we have a movement, a move to um, accept them to as they are? Oh, I got plenty of connection. Yeah, I'll I'll Should move to accept them. And is there a second? I'll I'll second that, Steve Roof. All right. Okay. And in no particular order. Ising. Yes. Davis. Yes. Chalker. Abstain. Roof? Yes. Goldner? Yes. Lanung? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Minutes are approved. All right. So the next thing on the list is uh, always comments from participants, from attendees. So if you have a, Martha uh, has her hand raised. So Martha, you can go ahead and unmute. 
Hello, everyone. Good evening. And I just wanted to briefly call your attention to something that I just learned about recently. And that is our town manager has sent to the town council a proposal to install four traffic circles in front of Fort River School in that one block of Southeast Street. Uh, and so you know, that's something that will be a big impediment to people walking, to children trying to cross, to anyone with a bicycle, and it's done to, quote, improve traffic flow. And so I just wanted to bring it to your attention. I sent the memo to Laurie because it seems to me that uh, you know, catering to our motor vehicles and encouraging them and discouraging people to walk or to bicycle would uh not be consistent with our climate goals. So just wanted to bring it to your attention. It's, it sure sounds like a, um, something a little overzealous. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. Uh, um, point, I, I wanna say that, um, you know, in the years I've been here and I'm sure you, I've seen an awful lot of traffic circles go in. Somebody clearly likes them quite a lot. We just had three new ones put in in my neighborhood. Um, and they're always contentious and I no longer know what the right answer is. I have to say when the ones went in at UMass, I lived in that neighborhood and I was very worried about them being a problem for pedestrians and bicyclists. And I have to say it hasn't turned out that way. Um, so I don't know what I think. The ones that just went in my neighborhood seem a little crazy too, um, but it's not as horrible as I originally thought. And uh, I don't really quite know what to think. I do think we get a little overzealous with them and it's worth considering and thinking about. So I will send that uh, memo that you sent me around to the rest of ECAC and maybe we can chat about it next time. And thank you for sending it. Four in that one short stretch does seem quite a lot. I, yeah, thank you. I would be interested in seeing the plans or a link to the plans to um, get a sense of that proposal. Yeah. And I have to say, I don't find traffic circles themselves dangerous. It's just the cars using them <laughs> that are a hazard. <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, there's always that. Um, all right. So if there's time at the end, I'll I'll maybe present that as a as an update. I'll share that today, but if not, we'll definitely have it on the agenda next time. So, agenda for next time. Okay, next. Um, any other questions from the attendees? Okay, in that case, we go to the agenda. And the first thing on the agenda are weight, the waste-related topics. So I heard back on two things. Um, I did hear back from, uh, let me get this right, give me a moment. Uh, we had a question, somebody made a comment a couple of weeks ago about black plastic not being recyclable at the transfer station. And they wondered, and they had heard that it was because um, some machine at Springfield can't read black plastic. <laughs> And in fact, that's exactly what Steve Talega, the solid waste supervisor for Amherst, wrote to me. It's not collected. Hmm? Uh, it's not collected at ATS. This is because the facility in Springfield that takes our material does not accept it. He's told that their sorting process has a difficult time sorting it, as do many other facilities. So the recycling guides, there was no online recycling guide. I asked him if there was one. He didn't give me an answer. He just said that the recycling guides at the transfer station list black plastic as non-recyclable. And we have signage posted near the collection area. So I think they only list this at the at the um, transfer station, which is why it wasn't easy to figure out <laughs> without going there. So it's it's a bit of an odd thing. I don't know what to think of it. Um, there's so many things that aren't recyclable. It seems a bit odd to not recycle something that should be because it's the wrong color. <laughs> but if that's as it is, I don't quite know what to do about it. Um, but that sort of brings up the other, the other trash related thing, uh, which is the waste hauler proposal that we talked about last time and that I promised to write a letter, which I think you all have a copy of now, right? 
Uh, of course, I managed to have closed yes. my copy. Um, they do. I sent it earlier, and um, it is in the meeting packet as well. Right, right. So um, I didn't. I just had a chance to finally <clears throat> dash this off today, and and you didn't make any changes, right, uh, Stephanie? Uh oh, sorry. No, I did not. No, I couldn't find my button. Um, no, okay. I did not make any changes. So in that case, let me share this and do some in editing. And I think this goes to the town manager and the town council. And if I understand the situation correctly, there is a request for proposals for a waste hauler for Amherst that has specific requirements that has gone out. And, um, and it was already sent out. It's done. I believe that proposal was accepted. The, the RFP was sent out. And so I think the purpose of the letter was to thank them for that and then encourage them to follow up on it when the RFPs come in to find a way to make this happen. And the particular things that were interesting that they're trying to make happen are a pay as you throw fee structure. So you're paid, you pay more for more trash, you know, not for a bigger bin or for the, a certain size bin, but for more trash, you pay more. And, and conversely, you pay less for less trash. And uh, also to have curbside uh, compost pickup, which would be a boon for me, I know. I would really appreciate that. Um, there is composting at the transfer station and also to figure out the future of the transfer station and how that figures into everything. So with that in mind, I will share my screen. And it was a simple, brief letter that was designed to go, I think, to the town council and town manager. But if I have that wrong, um, please let me know anyone who was here last time. I think that was the idea. Can you all see that? So simple to the point. Anybody want to change anything? Add anything? Hey, Lori. Um, I think this is fine, I, I guess, and I haven't been here, so you can ignore these comments, but I'm just not sure what the value is of us weighing in at this moment when I think what actually would be more useful is to see what the RFPs come back to say. Um, because oh. I, I don't know whether they're going, you know, anyway, I'm just, I'll just leave it at that. I don't mind sending this out. Um, but if like, pay as you throw comes back to be super expensive. Sure. I think we're going to have to really think through whether, and none of this shows up in our climate inventory. That doesn't mean it's not important stuff to do, but. Oh, you know, zero, zero waste does, right? I mean, no, we do not in our GHG inventory, we do not calculate oh, no. emissions of, or, or so right. I think I always think it's a little bit, it does align closely with our mission. Like, but it's not going to help us meet our climate goals as written because our climate goals are based on a baseline of emissions that don't include um, organic waste. But the zero waste is in the CARP. Yes, it does align closely with our mission. It does not help us meet our climate goals. goals. That's true. Well, it does. I mean, it does. It does, it's just that we're not accounting for it, right? Yeah, but we're not gonna be able to say like, we received a 2% reduction in our goals because we are composting more. That's true, but I, I still think, I mean, it's certainly something we wanna support, right? Um, and I, I, think, I think, I understand the concern about fee structures. So maybe the thing to do is to add a sentence here saying, you know, we, we hope you'll, we look forward to continued efforts and we hope you will involve ECAC in 
in what in in reviews? yes i mean i think that could be that could be helpful i think we would love to weigh in on the rfp because yeah it may be that it is a little more expensive and we think that the benefits outweigh the expense right um so i think we would like to be ad, you know serve an advisory role if possible i think that would would help make this letter a little bit more um meaningful in my opinion Right. Okay. So how about this? Uh, we support your continued efforts and hope you will consult with ECAC once proposals come in. Because obviously if it's going to be insanely expensive, nobody's going to want to do it. And I wouldn't blame them. I wouldn't want to do it either. Um, but you would think that, yeah, you'd think that it shouldn't be I mean, I think a lot of it depends on, you know, we're in a situation now where we used to have a half a dozen at least different local waste collectors and they were all bought up by USA Recycle. So the fact that there's no competition might make things difficult. Go ahead, Stephanie. Um, I just, I'm thinking about language here and I think I have a suggested language change. Go ahead. Instead of asking that you will consult with ECAC, I think that you will allow the ECAC to provide comment on the proposals. It's semantics, but I think it matters. Yep. I get it. That seems that seems fine. Thank you. on waste taller proposals or on responses to the RFP? Um, sure, I don't I, I don't know that we actually technically can do that. Um, I think if, uh, yeah, like they're not, when we get proposals, we're not allowed to just publicly share them. Right. Um, but I think um, maybe I don't know if the RFP has been drafted yet, but certainly that the things that we're looking for um, are the things that you would potentially want to weigh in on. I, I think the RFP. I think the RFP has gone out. Yeah, I think so too. That's why I'm saying I, I I'm not sure. Like at this stage, that that's really sort of the point at which you want to maybe have some influence. You're not allowed to look at the the responses, um, but I think maybe to provide comment on any final choice, um, yeah. you know, just because, you know, it's like when we were doing some other initiatives, you can sort of talk generally about, you know, um, I think about some of the proposals, but you can't say anything too specific. So, yeah, right. you know, I, again, just, you know, to provide comment, I think is enough. It's just indicating that you wanna have some involvement in reviewing what the town is doing. I think that's sufficient. Any how do you how's this, what's the right way on any successful proposals on any sure uh, sure on your um yeah I, I think on your on on the successful proposal on the successful proposal the one so that by then we don't have right you're so you're because at this point you're not going to be able to weigh in the if the RFP has right. been drafted and sent out you can't weigh in at, on that development at this point and when the proposals come in you can't look at you know, who get who we get, you know, that's going to be a very small group of reviewers that will be allowed to look at that. Um, and then they, uh, and then they'll announce who gets selected. So, but I think, but typically what happens, though, is that then there's a contract that gets developed. So it will include stuff from the, um, from the RFP, but sometimes there's a bit of negotiation. So you may want to just say that before the final contract is drafted, or, or you you know that maybe the ECAC yeah. has an opportunity to weigh in. But Stephanie, uh, I thought that for this in particular, the only thing the town council has agreed to is pursue an RFP. Right. There's yes. another round of public input once the RFPs come through before a contract is signed. Right. 
Um, well, not not usually. I mean, typically that's not how we do it. <laughs> when we when we put out for proposals and the proposals come in, those are not public public documents. Right. So because sometimes there's proprietary information, and so that's not a public process. So I don't know though if they'll discuss uh, generally. I'm not uh, really honestly. I'm not sure. I haven't been following it all that closely to be honest. Um. So I don't, I mean, I just don't think when the RFPs come in, you're going to be able to sort of have it, there'll be public discussion about it. All the, all the council did was authorize the town manager to do that. So it's not like the proposals will go to the council. Yeah. Okay. That was my understanding of it, but I will. Look I don't, I, I don't think I'm wrong on this point because that's not typically when the town contracts with someone like a waste hauler, it's not going to be something that the council reviews. It's something that the town manager does. Yeah. And the town manager can appoint a committee to review it and ECAC could yes, and, be on one on the committee. Well, right. But there may be other, I mean, I don't, it's not likely if there's going to be a representative from a committee and he's going to maybe, I don't know if he's going to have a counselor. I have no idea the process that they're going through other than it's mostly as I believe in the town manager's hands. So, uh, so that's my understanding. Yeah. So the article I'm reading from the Amherst current, which may or may not be, true is that the TSO and council anticipate that public outreach such as listening sessions about the proposed bylaw changes will be planned once responses to RFP have been received and reviewed. Okay. So I don't know what that means, but say that, say that again, Laura, I'm sorry, a little slower. Sorry. Um, you, but... And it links to a TSO report so I can see if I can find the original language but what it says is the TSO and council anticipate that public outreach such as listening sessions about the proposed bylaw changes will be planned once responses to the RFP have been received and reviewed okay so that that just means that they're discussing the bylaw changes not the proposals themselves so they're not going to just so the bylaw changes may reflect what the proposals are offering, but that doesn't mean that they're reviewing the proposals themselves. I, I've been here a long time and we've it's never been a public process when we are going out to bid for something. No, I work the same way in the federal government. There's a limited number of people who are allowed access to. Um, yeah, but what I'm saying is that I don't think the next step is the town manager accepts the bid. Right. right. I hear what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yes, I, um, but those are bylaw changes. I do think though, that there'll be some, like there will be a review committee and they'll, I think the bylaw changes would reflect who the, ultimately the, who the contract goes to. And that would that would make sense, but it doesn't mean that the town, like the town, won't choose the proposal first before the changes in the bylaw. Right. I'm not that part of the process. I'm not sure, but but potentially they could. The town manager could make that choice, and then because of that selection, that's what gets reflected in the changes in the bylaw. Yeah, so I think something like this covers it all, right? We support your continued efforts and hope you will allow ECAC, the ECAC, to provide comment or review as any contract is being negotiated or bylaws developed. Does that make sense? Just that we'd like to be, you know, we'd like to see what's going on <laughs> and maybe have an opportunity. And the right, the right addressees would be Paul and the town council. Does everyone agree? Stephanie, does that seem right? Sure, that's fine. Um, sure, that's if that's who you want to address it to, that's fine. So 
So I think for something like this, I'd like to, you know, get a have a have the support of ECAC. I don't want to send this as a individual, <laughs> uh, although I might. <laughs> but it's you know I I um I think it's important if we're going to send it as the ECAC that we have a vote on it. So is there a move to go ahead and use this as is, or are there further changes? Or do we think it's not worth sending? Uh, Lori, I would just, um, I think I would remove or review. Comment. Okay. Comment is fine. Just, yeah, there you go. I will go ahead and move that the ECAC uh, endorse this letter and ask the chair of ECAC to send it on to town manager and council. Is there a second? I second. Thanks, Andrew. So now I will stop sharing because I think we need to do a vote. Oh, great. The share thing is hiding. There it is. Thanks, Lori. Um, okay, so in no particular order, Roof? Yes. Issing? Yes. Lainung? Yes. Davis? Yes. Drucker? Yes. And Goldner? Yes. All right, okay, so I will, I will take it from there. Somebody, uh, um, Andrew in the notes, just make sure there's something about Lori will send this on to the, or Goldner will send this on so I don't forget. Um, all right, and back to the agenda, if I can find it. Ah, yes, solar bylaw review response. Um, Steve. Yes. Um... I'm not sure what to say here versus in agenda item number six, except I guess if this item was about me preparing something for ECAC review, I have to say I have not done that. Yeah, okay. Um, part of the reason is that the Massachusetts legislature is moving again on the solar, oh, what is it called? An enact act forget the full s2967 <laughs> um which is the solar siting uh so renewable energy infrastructure siting includes renewable energy infrastructure siting reforms as well as a host of other things to update massachusetts's um efforts to get renewable energy that is um been brought back i guess the house and the senate leaders have agreed and it was supposed to get voted on by the Senate earlier today, but it is delayed. It may get voted on by the Senate tomorrow, is what I hear. And I haven't yet seen a good analysis of what's in the bill. I've read bits and pieces of it. It's really hard to understand because basically the bill that they're voting on is just a bunch of excerpts that say such and such of mass general laws will be changed this will be added so you don't get a complete picture you just get the bits and pieces of it um anyhow that has the potential if it passes the to change up quite a bit the way um ground mount solar projects can be reviewed by the towns and cities um, i understand that the state rules would supersede the local rules on the other hand, the state may take another year or two to actually develop the rules, the specific rules, once this law is passed. Anyway, so that's up in the air. And that, so I do not have a um, 
anything specific for ECAC to work on in terms of what could we potentially do to increase solar development in and around town of all sorts. Um, I will keep thinking about that and try to come up with some ideas to bring back to ECAC for discussion. Thanks, Steve. And, and yeah, that was pulling out your topic for later to give it a little time if it needed it um, at the top of the schedule. Um, the uh, it, interesting to me that that uh, Andrew, I see your hand up. I just make one quick comment that, that this is a second. There's also um, S2930 something. I forget what the renewable, the, the big climate bill that everyone's been talking about. And the citing one is separate and it's all happening in the informal session at the last possible minute before it pretty much needs to go back to the drawing board uh, for the new legislature. So um, it's a little disturbing that all this stuff got put off, but good that it's happening. Um, all right, go ahead, Andrew. Um, I'm just wondering what effect this will have on our solar bylaw uh, draft, because like, is, will it be all, you know, <laughs> moot or uh, do we, should we wait to finalize the bylaw until we get you know, a, a sense of, of where this is going. That that came up last night at the CRC, the Community Resource Committee, which is a subset of the town council. Um, it came up, but the sort of the consensus was, well, we don't know, A, if it's going to pass, and B, how long it would take for actual regulations to come forth that would change what the town regulations might be. So the sense among CRC was to continue with their work, which is to continue refining the draft solar bylaw and bring it forward to town council at some point. It's probably still a couple of months, I'm guessing, in CRC before it will come to town council. So um, I guess just, just not enough information about the state, um, what's happening at the state level to cause a change in plans in at the Amherst level at the moment. Right, interesting. Um, so anything else on solar bylaw response? I guess not much, this is sort of to be put off for another day to see where things go. Right. Uh, right. Um, all right, and that, if nothing else, we're on to education and outreach. Um, Don is not here today. Uh, Tony is not here today. Heat pumps, I don't have a whole lot else to say. I um, I don't think there's anything new. Is there anything, should I, Stephanie, go ahead. Hi, sorry. Um, I actually do have an update from Tony, even though he couldn't attend ah, the meeting today. Okay. Okay. Um, so he said that the operations manager at Elevate is interested in hosting a joint energy transition meeting uh, with the ECAC um, or some kind of a panel or a conference or something in the spring. And Tony is happy to be the point person for that effort. Okay, and who is the person he said was interested in doing this? The operations manager at Elevate. Manager at Elevate, okay. Did he give a name? No. Okay, I can figure out who that is. Good. Um, that sounds like interesting, fun stuff to do and, and useful. There is um, concern, interestingly, this is sort of not directly related, um, but it's good to have a little more contact with the university because there's been quite a lot of concern among um, groups on campus, sustainability groups on campus, that the campus sustainability plan has sort of stalled lately. A lot of things have sort of stalled under our new fearless leader. Um, but uh, there's been quite a bit of concern. I don't know how much, we, we don't hear about it much anymore and we don't hear about any updates. Um, so that's a little concerning. So it would be interesting to have more contact with the university just to get some input and to get some, and perhaps apply some pressure to um, stay on top of things. Cause they're such a big user. I mean, this, they're the, <laughs> they're the biggest problem in Amherst, right? They're, they're the biggest polluter in Amherst in many ways. Um, so, all right. Uh, 
So that's good. Um, so next on the agenda, then, um, did you, uh, Stephanie, did you have anything you wanted to add about heat pumps or do you want to do that later? I can just do it later. Okay. Climate resilient schools. Um, I do think we mentioned this last time, but didn't we get a ride rolled? We got a notice about an upcoming ride walk. What is it? Ride roll to school. Um, didn't we have something on that? I thought I had something on that and I don't remember what it was. All right, I don't have it handy, so I'm gonna skip that then, um, unless there's anyone else who knows anything about climate resilient schools and what's going on there. There, there was a ride to school event last week or two weeks ago in the Amherst Public Schools that I understand uh -huh. was fairly popular among Good. the school kids. Good, thanks Steve for letting us know. I knew there was something either coming up or just it was, it was close and I just, Spaced it for this week, so good. Um, okay, on to advisory and support. Um, rental building efficiency by law, anything more on that, Steve? Only a little, I just got earlier today, actually after I was in another meeting just before this one, I got an email message from the Equitable Rental Electrification Learning Group Planning. That's the E-R-E-L-G-P, I guess. <laughs> um, this is something that I think Stephanie has also signed up for. It's um, basically a group of people that want to start exploring ideas for electrification of rental housing and affordability issues. And it's basically just a collaborative group to try to um, identify potential solutions and have discussions. So looks like they're going to try to have a meeting and uh, schedule a meeting in November and December have monthly meetings through summer of 2025. So I will be looking forward to attending that next, well, in November, and then reporting back to you all what sort of ideas I hear about. That is fantastic. And that was that group that I had also wanted to join, but I got, my, my semester has gotten insane. Um, I may still try to join if it's not too late because I will be quite free in the spring and next summer, so. Um, and so far as they're going to continue meeting by December, I should have a lot of time to okay. spend something like that. Um, but that's great that you're doing that, Steve. So <laughs> thank you. And Stephanie, too. Um, so uh, draft solar bylaw we covered. Transportation, Tony's not here. But maybe this is the place where I should share the memo that Martha sent. How about that? What do you think? Good. Okay, let me bring it up. Hang on a moment. It will take me just a moment to get this. Um, so uh, we'll want to add this to the packet, I guess. Um, uh, let's see. Hang on a minute. There it is. I think the important thing is this picture, if I can find it to that one or this one. I think it was this one. Trafficcircles.pdf. Nope, that's not it. Um, somewhere there was a picture. Transparent plan, that's probably it. Yes, there it is. Okay, so let me go ahead and share this. Uh, let, me, let me open it in, in something better than a browser, give me a second. Uh, oh dear. Moment. Having a bit of trouble with my There we go. Yes, okay, good. Uh, that will be easy to see. So 
Wait one more moment. I'm getting there. All right, share. Come on. Okay, so this is the plan. I might as well just put this up because that makes it pretty clear. And the traffic circles are where the stops, I believe. Um, wait, does it show with circles? I'm pretty sure they're uh, here, 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 and here, but let me check the, hang on a minute. Main Street, public entrance to the school, school bus entrance to the school, and College Street. No. So not this one. This this traffic, this this becomes a circle. This be, Can you guys see my pointer? This becomes a circle. Yes. That becomes a circle. Yep. Yeah, and the, this becomes a circle, but not this one. This is just a, actually with the circle, you don't need this one anymore. So this goes away, I suspect. Um, you know, it, right now, the biggest problem is just that there's no place for bikes to go at all. And it's a fairly, it, there's just no, no good place for bikes to ride and not so much on, well, on Southeast Street and also on Main Street and College Street. Um, there's just no real access. And the potholes uh, and the pothole filling makes the margin of the road dangerous. Um, I mean, just repaving would be a big improvement. Um, I mean, the problem that I had originally with circles was that, you know, where, when do you stop so that people can, can cross, right? Especially as this is in elementary school. When does the traffic stop, right? Um, but what seems to have happened on the UMass campus, and those are fairly big, relatively fast moving circles, I think these might be a little slower um, and smaller. <clears throat> the smaller they are, the slower people tend to go around them, right? Um, the way they put the crosswalks, it's fairly easy to see somebody coming and to stop. And it does tra stop traffic in the circle momentarily. Um, but I haven't heard if there have been accidents or problems, those, those circles have been there now for maybe 10 years. And I have not heard of accidents. Um, so like I say, it, it seems counterintuitive and I have ridden my bike through them many times and I don't find them particularly difficult to negotiate. The one I find worse actually is the one on Triangle Street. Um, it's too crowded. There's five five entrances, I think, one, two, oh, yeah. four at weird angles. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's uh, I just about got killed there once when somebody just didn't, I was in the circle on my bike and they didn't see me and kept going. Um, and I, I slammed on the brakes and missed them by about an inch. <laughs> or they missed me by an inch. So it was, uh, you know, it was a little hair raising, but that's the only time I've ever had a problem. And it wasn't with the ones that I think these are fairly square-ish. This, this one isn't, but it's also a, a bigger, easier to negotiate circle. That one on triangle is really sort of crazy. Lori, I don't know if you can see, but Laura has her hand up. I'm sorry, Laura, go ahead. No, I didn't see that. It's... Oh, thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Lori. Yeah, I mean, I think it is well within the role of ECAC to express support for making whatever traffic changes are made be as walker and biker friendly as possible. I don't know our new members very well, but none of the rest of us are traffic engineers. <laughs> and this plan is made by traffic engineers and... There's lots of data on roundabouts and they're, uh, if designed well, can be quite supportive of pedestrian disability and bicycle traffic and also result in reduced emissions because um, less people are driving slower, there's less stopping and starting um, and less traffic buildup generally as a result of traffic circles. So I wouldn't feel comfortable with ECAC making any comments on the pros or cons of traffic circles. I think we have a lot of status quo bias against them, um, yeah. just generally. But I do think, to your earlier point, Lori, like anything we can do to support biking and walking 
we should. And that may mean making sure that the roundabouts are designed in such a way that they do um, right. facilitate that as much as possible. I mean, you can imagine there being a, a nice big wide bike path with a sidewalk next to it along this strip here, right? And that would bypass all the circles and, and make it much easier and safer for everyone. Um, except as you need to cross the street, right? And then that just has to be engineered correctly. So I, I don't, I yeah, can imagine. Yeah, and there should be a crosswalk person. I mean, not all the time, but during school yeah. hours. And anyway. Yeah. And yeah, I do think we shouldn't waste this opportunity of updating this traffic pattern to improve bicycle and pedestrian safety. And maybe writing a letter to that, you know, whatever they do there, we understand this is the plan. Please make sure bicycles and pedestrians are front and center. Um, yeah. What what is the status? This is you're showing the map, and there was a memo associated with this. Yeah, is this memo. Uh, something that has going out for a traffic analysis, or has it come back and it's further along in the planning stage? Like, like how definite is the plan for these um, traffic circles? It hasn't been funded yet, from what I can tell. But this is this is the thing right here. The Department of Public Works was asked to research options to address the impact of increased traffic flow on Southeast Street and neighboring roads because of the new school. Because um, I think it's it's basically two it's, it's double the traffic, double the number of students, right? Um, the Department of Public Works was asked. Let's see, where is it? Blah blah blah. Okay, uh, so plan is here to install four roundabouts at four intersections to allow for improved traffic flow along the corridor with the least impact to East Common and adjacent properties. So no bike path on the East Common, I guess. <laughs> the details of specific data used to reach this conclusion were included in the report and appendices titled Fort River Elementary School Traffic Engineering Services Final Report by CDM Smith. Uh, once oh, a little bit to the beginning of the letter, is this from... It's a recommendation from Paul to town council. Okay, so he's asking council to approve these changes as made by this CDM Smith traffic study engineering services report from July 2020. Okay. In particular, I think it's going to need funding. Yeah, the concept design is approved. I think he needs approval and then to contract them with uh, with them they'll need funds. Funds will be needed to be appropriate. Pay for design. Yeah. And design. Okay. And well, yeah, I, I mean, I find this very interesting. Um, I'd want to be careful as part of ECAC to figure out sort of whether and how ECAC would might want to weigh in on it. Um, and I'd want to probably do that in consultation with the Transportation Advisory Committee, uh, sort of join, help, help them. It seems like it falls more squarely within that committee than within ours, but we could help support it. Um, but I'd love to learn more from them about it. Right, I would agree. Um, so do we have anybody who's attending TAC meetings these days? Or was I, thinking about it? Uh, when are TAC meetings? Does anyone know offhand? Was it, I don't know off the top of my head, but if you give me a minute, I can find it. Okay, thanks. Wasn't Tony part of or attending to mm -hmm. Intersect? with I think Transportation Tony Advisory been, Committee? Yeah, I think it might have been Tony. Yeah, his name is next to the transportation update. Uh, so, okay. yes. That's a good clue. <laughs> <laughs> so, it might be worth, I mean, I could also reach out to the chair of TAC and see what their thoughts on this are. Maybe I'll do that. I can just, I can do that, right? Uh, so that doesn't, that doesn't uh, violate any. That's totally fine. Okay, good. So let me write myself a note to do that and maybe maybe put in the minute somewhere that Lori will reach out to chair of TAC or Goldner will reach out to a chair of TAC regarding um, supporting pedestrian and and, uh, and bike traffic on Southeast Street by the new school. Is, is that memo way. on the town website someplace? 
I'm guessing not because I think it's from Paul to the town council. So why should it be right? Um, the, think... This this memo yeah. will be in the town council meeting packet. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. And do you happen to know if this report from the CDM Smith engineers, is that all, is that someplace on? Yeah, it looks like it would have to be. Well, it says it's attached. So it would oh, be part oh. of the packet as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. It'll be interesting to see. All right, I'll stop sharing now. Okay. So, um, all right, we have a plan there to do, just to do some reach outreach around that. I am very glad that something is happening. I just wish they would extend it around the corner onto Pelham Road. <laughs> <laughs> and then put in something, at any rate. Um, all right, what else? Uh, next, anything else on transportation? Regional and state policy updates. We've already heard a little bit. Uh, I have a little bit more. The climate bill, as I sent, I, I forwarded the announcement from Mass Zero Carbon, I think, Zero Carbon Mass, um, that the climate bill is not dead and might even be voted on sometime soon. Uh, it has some interesting things in it that I didn't know about. Uh, I didn't read a very extensive, I didn't look at it yet, but according to reports I've seen, one thing that, that struck me as interesting, if nothing else, is that, you know, Massachusetts has on the books, we are, we are nuclear free, we are a nuclear free zone, there, there will be no development of any nuclear plants in Massachusetts, it's not, they, they, apparently some years ago, after they shut down um, Pilgrim, they just decided they weren't going to develop anymore or allow development anymore. Um, however, the new climate bill allows us to buy nuclear energy from, I think it's Seabrook, is it, in New Hampshire, from New Hampshire and other places in New England, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> so um, we will have some nuclear in our portfolio again sometime soon. I think I read something, sorry, Laurie, to jump in, but I think I also read something recently that there was another uh, proposal um, around Love Canal, which I thought was kind of interesting for another nuclear facility. Oh, so it's weird. I just, I think I was reading an, uh, an article about how there seems to be like a new renewed interest in nuclear development. So, well, there's a reason for that, that I can explain. Um, the, the specific interest is in what are called small modular reactors, right. um, which, <laughs> okay. So, so the, the, you know, I can see both sides of this with, with visceral feelings on both sides. It's sort of interesting. Um, on one side, small modular reactors are sort of a cool idea. They're, they're small, they're assembled in the factory, they're, they're all sorts of improvements in passive safety so that they don't melt down quite as easily as Vermont Yankee might have. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there are lots of improvements. On the other hand, um, on the other hand, the cynic and, and anti-nuclear activist in me says that, um, they are just the latest attempt to, uh, you know, big, big nuclear plants didn't work. So let's try small ones. <laughs> and, and they are, you know, they can be as small as five megawatts, whereas a normal nuclear reactor is about a gigawatt. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and you can use them locally for a small product, you know, to run a small factory, to run, to run a factory, to run a, they, I think they were originally developed for uh, things like submarines and have been now redeveloped and redeveloped and redeveloped. And there, there's nothing really innovative about them except that they're small. <laughs> and uh, there is a group at, and the reason there's suddenly so much interest in these, and this is what I sort of said first, is that last summer, the Biden administration announced they were gonna spend $900 million on the development of these things, small modular reactors, and the grants, the call for grants just opened last week. So, <laughs> so there is renewed interest in small modular reactors all of a sudden, and everybody wants in, and there are a lot of startup companies, including uh, at least one at MIT, that is trying to put them somewhere outside of the state. And this is how I knew they weren't allowed in the state because they can't put them in the state. Um, <laughs> So that's why there is renewed interest in small modular reactors. 
I also read there was an article in the New York Times a few days ago. Um, tech companies, including Google and Microsoft oh. and Amazon, are also looking to. I guess they're funding the development of these small nuclear potential power plants, yeah. so they yeah. use them alongside their data centers um, to help oh. power artificial yeah. intelligence. It's much worse than that. Um, they're actually going to reopen Three Mile Island, right? Microsoft bought Three Mile Island right. and will reopen it because of AI. So this is why, uh, you know, in my mind, we we talk about AI at, at UMass like it's some amazing thing that's going to change the world. And every time somebody brings it up, I remind them that every time you're using AI, you are contributing to the climate crisis in a really bad way because it's completely derailing our ability to do the energy transition. You know, um, and I think I mentioned here once before that that Costa Rica, uh, which has a completely green grid, had to open up an oil plant a couple of years ago because of data because of a combination of new data centers that are drawing enormous amounts of power off their grid, which are popping up all over Latin America because uh, of cheap labor and cheap land, and uh, a drought. So their hydro wasn't at full capacity. And the thing about nuclear is, and this also folds nuclear in, because the thing about nuclear is that it is the highest capacity. You know, you get the average nuclear plant works at 93% capacity all the time, right? The average gas plant, I think, is only 60% or something like that, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe because, because it has to go down for maintenance. And the average solar and wind, of course, are only 25 or 30. So one nuclear plant is like four of the others. <laughs> so if you need a lot of energy, yeah, there's going to be a lot of interest all of a sudden in, in nuclear. Go ahead, Stephanie. This is just a correction. I had said Love Canal because I'm stuck in my, you know, ah. 1970s environmental disastrous, you know, <laughs> projects. Um, but I meant Three Mile Island. Right. So um, so I just wanted to correct that. But also, I think I might have read the same article that Steve was referencing as well. Yeah, it's, it's not just that one. They're talking about building new large reactors, too. Yes. Um, which yes. is, you know, it, you know, it, it's it's a real, it it, 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 it twists my, my guts in knots, right? Because the physicist in me knows that nuclear reactors are the quickest way to get, to get carbon out of it. I mean, if we're, if, if we're serious about trying to reduce carbon and, and that's the overriding thing, nuclear would help. It would help fast, but it's it's become it is it is terribly terribly dangerous in too many ways, and it, and it creates its own problems. And we don't need it. We don't need it. So I don't know. Uh, Stephanie, your hand's still up, and then Andrew. Okay, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to bring up other countries' uh, approach to nuclear. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, a recent example I've seen is the approach that Germany and the approach that France took to nuclear power, di di very divergent approaches. And France is maybe the most, has the most reliability on nuclear and their carbon emissions are, are much, much less than Germany's, which completely did away with their nuclear energy system. Um, and, you know, when you, this day and age, we don't have enough capacity or anything. We don't have enough renewable capacity to replace nuclear energy when we shut it down. Um, I think more regionally, uh, New York shut down its nuclear energy, uh, the Indian Point energy plant, and uh, they had to open up a lot of new natural gas plants to replace that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a difficult, uh, <laughs> it's a difficult trade-off. Um, you're you're either going to build nuclear or you're going to build, you know, some amount of of fossil fuel plants because it's it's not easy to to switch on renewable energy. Um, as we've seen in town, it's hard to site new solar arrays. Um, it's probably easier to create. Well, I don't know if it's easier to create small nuclear reactors, um, but uh, it's. You know, you're you're increasing the chance of of fossil fuels if you completely ban yeah. nuclear energy. Um, I agree, we don't need it in an ideal world, but I think um, it's it, it, there's a lot of nuance. I think to this discussion, there is. If we do have. I mean, I want to be clear. We we have the capacity in renewables. We can do this, right? It's. I mean, Texas has virtually done it just by. <laughs> just by virtue of the fact that when there was a lot of money in putting in wind plants. 
um, you know, you, it's possible. It just takes a lot of effort and, and it takes a lot of desire and political will. And uh, the problem, you know, and there are, and like I say, I can speak passionately on either side of the nuclear uh, question, but I do think that, uh, you know, they become such a, a target for terror and war um, if that Indian Point, you know, if Fukushima happened at Indian Point, Manhattan would be would be gone. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's, I think if I remember right, how far is Indian Point from Manhattan? It's fairly close to the city, isn't it? I think it's under 100 miles. Under 100, so it, maybe not, but it's usually a 30 mile, a 20 mile, 20 mile exclusion zone is what is going on at both Fukushima and and Chernobyl right now. And it was larger at Fukushima to start with and smaller at Chernobyl, interestingly. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's, it's right, it's not good. And depending on which way the wind blows and, and everything else, it's it's just too close. And then there's also the problem of more people were, ki were killed in the, in the um, evacuation of Japan around Fukushima than in the disaster itself, many more. Um, so it's, <laughs> You know, if you could imagine the, when they when I was growing up, they had Shoreham on Long Island. If you could imagine trying to evacuate people, you know, from Long Island, it ain't gonna happen. So it, it's just it's very problematic in many ways. Um, but it's also something that you know could have saved the world fifty years ago, <laughs> maybe. All right. Yeah. You might remember, Lori, there was a nuclear power plant um, proposed for Montague back in the 70s. Do you remember that? No, I wasn't here in, in the 70s. Uh, yeah, it was um, actually, and it was one of the proposals and the opposition to it was one of the events that kind of kicked off the big um, nationwide anti-nuclear movement. Right. You can look it up on Wikipedia or someplace. But yeah, up on the sand plains of Montague, there was some proposals. I don't think they got very far, but there were some proposals for, uh, oh, wouldn't that be a great location for a nuclear power plant? Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, you have something? Yes, I was going to say that I'm, I'm going to digress a little bit. I actually live not far from Vermont Yankee. Mm -hmm. um, so when we first moved to our house, we used to get calendars <laughs> annually and radiation pills <laughs> so oh, <great. laughs> when my kids were little we had a little stash of radiation pills kept I, very handy just in the event that we needed them which mm -hmm. was kind of terrifying but um so uh, but i was going to say you know there's one thing about developing these plants but the fact that we are allowing content for nuclear in our electricity supply mix is also driving that development. So I think if yeah. the state were really to take a stand, then the state would not allow that content. And it, mm -hmm. it exists now, I know for sure, you know, it exists in our um, utility um, package. So okay. I just think that's, you know, the, the, you know, to me, part of that is, you know, getting the advocacy could be really to sort of getting the state to also not include that as part of our energy supply. Yeah. Yeah, so that's if we were going to go down that road. For a while, the state was including biomass as part of renewable oh. energy. And after protests, that was eliminated. Yeah. So it's, it's a good one, Stephanie. If people are opposed to nuclear, we should sit, tell the state we don't want it in our energy mix, whether mm -hmm. if it comes out of state. Yeah. It's there is a difference. Bit... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. There is a difference there, right? Biomass really is not a, a CO2 saver at all. It's, it's, it's just a lie. <laughs> And, and nuclear is, but it has other issues that that many people consider just overriding, and um, and I understand that. And I, you know, I I don't know what to think these days. Honestly, there are places that really want nuclear in the south. There are lots of nuclear plants, and they're putting in new ones. If they want it, and that's how they're going to clean up their grid, I'm not going to tell them to stop. You know, <laughs> just, um, but I I. You know, it's not something we need to do. It's absolutely not something we need to do. Hmm. Any rate. Um, yeah, just to ahead. just, I mean, I don't think ECAC is going to solve this problem, but um, <laughs> so we can oh, move on. on. But I, to Stephanie's point, I mean, I do think it's hypocritical for us to buy nuclear and have it be produced in other people's backyards if we're not willing to put it in our own backyard. Yeah. Exactly. Um, 
I also think to Andrew's point that if we are going to be fighting tooth and nail against solar and transmission line increases and other things that we need, it's very difficult to see how we get there without, without things like nuclear. So it's there, you know, we as humans have impacts on the environment and I think we have to figure out how we're minimizing those as much as possible. Um, yeah in the most holistic way possible. So I don't have a good answer to this one other than AI, just building nuclear for AI is definitely not the answer. And that's what's oh, happening. That's, that is really horrible. Um, okay, so the only other regional and state thing I had was that the first light, I, I really haven't quite, I haven't gone to any of these meetings, but I really would like to at some point, there appears to be quite a lot of, from the note that I got from Joe Comerford and sent to everyone on ECAC, um, I can I can post it, but I think we're I, I don't know if I bring it up. Or I can just summarize. She's been sending updates on what's going on with the first light relicensing. Um, this is right. involving the the giant hydroelectric battery that lives on top of Northfield Mountain <laughs> and the uh, Turner's Falls hydroelectric plant. Um, and there has from her notes, I infer that there has been quite a lot of um, of, uh, of pushback on relicensing, which is astounding to me because, you know, yes, these things both have environmental impacts. Everything has an environmental impact, but I don't think you can do better than hydroelectric with a water battery storage system, right? I mean, they, they literally pump water up the mountain and let, let it come down to fill in, you know, when they need, when, when the solar isn't working or the wind isn't working, we have this giant hydroelectric battery. Um, <laughs> or storage system. Uh, so now it seems that from her last note, the issues have come down to water, um, the Clean Water Act, clean water issues, um, which is fine. I mean, I'm not, if there are rules that should be followed, they should be followed. We should do the least damage we possibly can. Um, but I hope this thing isn't at danger of being not relicensed. So I really would like to show up at one of the upcoming meetings. And if any of you can, if you hear of one of these meetings and you can go, please go and let your voice be heard. Or if there's a call for input on some website, let's, let's make sure we all do it. Um, because this is what we need. You know, it's unfortunate that we had to take a mountain and turn it into a storage facility, but it, as, as environmental impacts go, that's, that's one of the better options. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, if there's nothing else, Regional and state, we can go to, anyone else have any other regional or state updates? All right, staff updates. You're on, Stephanie. Sure, um, a very quick ones tonight. Um, so I've been working on the energy efficiency community block grant funding that the that I think I've been talking to you about for quite some time. Uh, we got $76,400 uh, allocated to the town. We didn't have to apply for it. We were just basically I mean, I have to apply only through a voucher, but I we don't have to actually apply to get funds. We're kind of allocated the funds. So we're going to be using it to purchase um, an electric truck for the facilities department. And I think the facilities now is all, I don't know how many vehicles they have. I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head. It's not a lot, but um, they're going to be all electric. So that's kind of exciting. Um, and also uh, the police department is looking to install um, charging, EV charging, so that they can transition vehicles to all electric, which I cannot tell you how happy this makes me when department heads call me and want to talk about this stuff. Um, so we're probably going to try to use some of the funds because we are, the cost of the vehicle itself doesn't utilize all the funds. So I'm going to try to get an associated charging station, but we would install that at the police department, which is where the police department is wanting it. Um, and then we're going to, I reached out to the fire department. We might be able to get a dual head um, charging unit for there as well. I don't know for sure that I'll have the information I need to get theirs, but I think we'll be successful at least with the vehicle and the charging station behind APD. So that's cool. kind of exciting because um, I'm realizing, you know, we have a lot of a fair, I won't say a lot, but we have a fair amount of EV charging infrastructure in Amherst. I've been to other communities and I have to say for a smaller town, we're doing pretty well. Um, we have 14 ports and we're about to have um, 16 soon with the two EV charging stations that'll go in. Um, 
the fast charging stations that are going in in the CVS lot. That is moving forward. We have till December 31st. I think if we need an extension, we can ask for it, but we're really trying very hard not to have to request that so that we can get those in. Um, I'd really love to get that off my plate. Uh, and then the other thing that I was working on is, um, I'm trying to think of the other thing that was timely. Uh, the um, the uh, electric bikes, the Valley bikes. Um, so part of the problem with the station that we had um, in front of town hall was that it was uh, kind of rusty and old. The equipment wasn't in great shape. And Drop Mobility has new equipment that's going to be rolling out, but we can't roll out a Drop Mobility station when all the other equipment in town is Bowiegan equipment. It, it won't really work. So um, it turns out that they do have some Bowiegan equipment that they may be able to pull together a station um, that we can install at least until we start that transition to all of Drop Mobility bikes. So that's kind of exciting. I don't know exactly when that's going to happen, but hopefully sooner than later. So um at least I, I'm hoping by the spring we should have the station in front of town hall again. Mm. Um, so I think that's it. I don't know if I had another update. Any more? Any more updates on the heat pump RFP? Just it's um they're just developing some of the outreach. Uh, as I said, we are looking for one to three households to be pilot cases. So again, if folks know of people. I don't know if we'll actually be putting something out. Um, and But I mean, I'm just starting with this group because you all are pretty connected to folks in the community, especially those that are maybe interested in installing heat pumps if they haven't already. So if people are willing to be a test case, uh, we need one to three households. So you could just let me know, send them my way, and I can right. connect them with CET. Yeah, and I found that note this morning and I totally forgot to follow up on it. So I'm gonna follow up on it as soon as we're done today. I wanna to ask um, what, um, do they need to have no heat pumps currently in the house? Do they, are there any other requirements that they need to be low income? Is there anything else or just pilot program, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I think pilot program, it doesn't really matter. I mean, ideally we would love to have low income households mm -hmm. to start with, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not, I don't think it's an absolute necessity if there is someone, a household that's willing to do this because, mm -hmm. you know, basically they're going to be the test case, right? So they have to know that it's going to be slow. It might be clunky and how this all moves, you know, through the process. So they just, we're going to need folks that are going to be patient. So I don't think it absolutely has to be a low income household, but that is preferable. Okay. I definitely have a couple of groups I can write to, so I will make sure I do that. Uh, today. And if anyone else has a neighborhood association or, you know, anyone you can reach out to, um, or if you don't have any heat pumps yourself and you want to you know, put heat pumps in, um, that would be great. Could I ask, um, or maybe not, it's a question, but it's a, um, something I hadn't thought about, but it, before I was talking to the um, Amherst College Sustainability Director, a while back and he mentioned kind of like some of the challenge they're, they're they're having a bit of a challenge where they don't have any ev chargers in the student parking lots and there's a couple students that have evs that can't charge their cars and i just think it's an interesting unique problem in amherst with three universities and as more evs become available on the resale market. And, you know, there are, you know, I think we're going to see more students with EVs, hopefully, like we want to see that. Um, but how to organize charger charging that aligns with student behavior and needs. I don't know, just throwing that out there as something that may be worth seeing if the colleges are talking about it or what we would do, if anything, about that. I can I can say at Hampshire College, there's been some talk of assigning on or working with some companies that would provide EV chargers essentially free of charge for the installation oh. funded by state grants, I believe. I, I'm not entirely clear. Um, and then they would be operated um, 
the software to control them would come from a company and they would take a slight charge per KWH that goes through the chargers. Um, so people would, would have to pay that plus whatever Hampshire College wanted to charge for it. But it was surprising that, that seemingly the, uh, the, this company would come in and do all the logistics and planning and installation for almost no cost to the college. Um, if other institutions want to know more about that, I can go look up the details. And Laura, I could chat with Wes about that at Amherst College if he was interested. Sounds good. Thanks, Steve. I see Laura nodding her head. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else? Staff updates? Uh, no, I think that's pretty much all I had at the top of my head. Okay, ECAC member updates. Anybody Actually, else? I was just, sorry, I was curious, Stephanie, the chargers that the town sort of has management over, is there statistics on their usage? Uh, you know, I, I've i asked, but oh. I have not gotten that information. So I, so I had gotten the funding, secured the funding, got it all set up. Originally things were in my name and then I handed it all over because the financial management of that was sort of out of my hands and I didn't want it either. <laughs> so, so all of that, um, you know, so others have more of the access to the data now. And I've asked several times and I've been told, oh yes, we'll make sure you have access, but I haven't yet. So I will ask again. That's <laughs> all I can do. Yeah, I'm not sure what it would tell us or what we'd be looking for in the data. I'm just sort of curious, you know, what sort of what capacity, however you measure capacity of use, what I capacity can, they're seeing. Yeah, I can tell you just, I mean, my own observation of behind Town Hall here since yeah. they've been installed. I mean, for years there was, you know, for a while and definitely a few years, very little usage, you know, other than the, you know, the town had a vehicle that we you know, we purchased the unit with an association and with an electric vehicle. Um, and there was very little usage. And now the unit in back of town hall, almost there's almost always two vehicles there on most days. You know, I, I'm one of them. I will, I will admit that I'm one of them, but um, I can tell you that more staff has electric vehicles or, or plug-in hybrid. So there's definitely, you know, they're starting to show up more. Like there have been days where I've gone to, I've had to go to two or three locations to find an mm -hmm. available port. So it doesn't happen often, but it has happened. Is um, parking time limited there? Are you supposed to only park for a few hours or half a day? Four or hours. Four hours. They're limited limit? to four hours. Yep. Okay. Yep. And that's part of a charging um, system. You 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 pay for the charge. Yes. Is that yes. one of the commercial ones, like Charge Point? <clears throat> charge Point, right? Yeah. So you, yeah, we all of our units in town, uh, the commercial ones are Charge Point. So the ones that I was just talking about that I'm trying to secure for the municipal vehicles obviously would not be commercial units. They'd be only for municipal vehicle use. Right. Um, but the ones that are the charge point are commercial and there's a fee associated with using the power, but also you pay for the parking spot as well. Yeah. But it's still pretty low right now. Our um, rate, I think, is 20 cents per KWH. Hmm. So it's pretty low. And that is likely to change. Unfortunately, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I think the rates are going to increase. Well, it's getting to be winter. They always increase in the winter. And and that rate, is that decided by the town? Is that a decision the town makes, what the rate is? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Any other, any, any member updates? Oh, I know. I, I, I had a question, Stephanie, I'm trying to remember exactly what I wanted to ask, but it had to do with the Valley Green Energy and whether you knew if the town, for the electrical accounts that the town has control over, do you know if they are opting for the 100% renewable option? We are not. Um, Ooh, yes. The town, <laughs> I know, the town 
is using uh, Constellation Energy, I think is our okay. yep. provider. Um, they There's a special rate through the Mass Municipal Association. So a lot of municipalities actually have been using Constellation. Um, however, I, I will say that I we didn't go for the 100% green content because of the price, but I was able to advocate for us going for more greener content, which we did. Oh, through Constellation? Yes. Yeah. So okay. I'm sorry to say it's not 100%, but it is more than we were doing. So I was just happy for that little victory. Yeah, <laughs> so. that's that's the same at Hampshire College. We have two big accounts with with um, independent suppliers for the main campus, but then the college owns various smaller accounts, residents. Um, those should be should have been transitioned to the Valley Green Energy Program, and I'm advocating to see if we can up to the hundred percent renewable because it's a pretty good deal. You're not paying a whole lot more and you're getting 100% renewable in Massachusetts class one recs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for us, and we calculated it would cost like the college $7,000 more. But then on the other hand, we're spending about 7,000 bucks to buy recs for the electricity that's not covered, that's not considered renewable. And those are just cheap wind recs from the Midwest. So it would be much better overall if we went with 100% Valley Green Energy. But we'll see. Haven't haven't heard back from the finance people yet. Yep. And then I guess I, another part of my question is, is the town working or is Valley Green Energy working with some of the other larger um, businesses and energy users to encourage them to consider the 100 percent? Is that part of the outreach of the Valley Green Energy program? It probably will be. B, it's not right now. I'm, you know, we're, we definitely want to encourage businesses to, you know, to sign on if they haven't. Um, but, you know, right now it's anyone that's on basic service, anybody that's on basic service was automatically opted in. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you. Any other updates? Okay, one cute thing that that I had happened this month, I got Berkshire Gas called me and emailed me. I think they texted me and emailed me because they were concerned that my gas usage had changed dramatically. <laughs> because it was zero this month for the first time, I think, in my life, I'm in a house that used absolutely no fossil fuels for a month. So... <laughs> Heat pump, hot water, solar assisted heat pump, water heater went in a month ago. And I had to I had, call to gas and assure them that this was exactly as expected. <laughs> I had the same thing happen to me when I installed my heat pump, hot water heater. It was a nice conversation to have. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so at any rate, um, all right, let's see, back to the, not to, Back to the thing. I think we have items for the agenda items for the next meeting. There are no other updates. Um, I think we had a couple along the way. We definitely want to follow up on the transportation. Um, what to do about? I'll I'll try reaching out to the chair and get back to people on that. So that should be on there somewhere. Um, I can have my name next to it as as well as um, Tony's. Um, and then the uh, solar bylaw response, of course, stays on. And there was one other thing, wasn't there? We talked about traffic circles, so I don't know if we want to follow up on that with a, what were we going to do on that? We were going to do something following up with a letter of support, perhaps. Oh, that's right. I'm going to do TAC and then we'll follow up with it. Never mind. Um, I'll reach out to TAC. Um, follow up on the, well, that can be part of the uh, member updates or, or uh, group coordination if Tony's here to talk about the um, plans for the spring with Elevate. And was there anything else anyone can think of that's off the usual, different from the usual? Solar efficiency uh, 
solar bylaw should certainly be on there again. Keep track of what's going on there. See if we need to write something. Yeah, you got that. Yeah. You mentioned that, so it's on here. Okay. All right. So if there's nothing else that folks can think about, the next thing we do is go back to public comment, right? I'm going to let Martha in. Martha, you can go ahead and unmute. Hello again. I have a little more information about the review process for the traffic circles. District 5 had a district meeting last evening, and that was one of the subjects they talked about. So it's gone to the TSO committee of the council for review, and they are also then going to be seeking alternative uh, proposals or suggestions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, for example, instead of four traffic circles, maybe two or um, something or uh, looking at alternate things, too. So that's going to go on for a while, I expect, uh, before that gets uh, resolved. And I would say that one of the biggest concerns about traffic circles is the impact on people with disabilities, either mobility issues or visual impairment. I mean, I really don't think that guide dogs are too good at, uh, you know, navigating all the uh, pieces of a traffic circle and so on. And so the our town's disability committee has been quite concerned. And there's a memo that I've uh, received that Laurie, I'll forward to you that they wrote concerning the the uh, traffic circle at Triangle. Yeah. What they say is just a barrier for people with disabilities to come from from the north amherst uh you know walking uh to downtown and so they're quite concerned uh, and that may really i think is one of the biggest objections uh, to the traffic circles and i also would be concerned about children i mean it's one thing for a, a mobile adult or an adult on a bicycle to be able to you know, understand the different directions that traffic is coming and, and so on. But for children coming to school, um, I mean, I would have a big concern if I had a young kid going to the elementary school. So that's a concern. Um, but let's see. And and I would like to, I gave some thought, the intersection of Route 9 there and uh, Southeast Street, I go through there every day, and I consider that to be a very safe intersection for both vehicles and um, pedestrians uh, because it has left turn lanes and left turn arrows for every one of the four directions as it goes through the cycle. And then it has a pedestrian um, setup where, you know, if you push the pedestrian light, all traffic in all four directions stops. And so it's very safe for anybody, children, people with mobility or visual uh, disabilities and so on. So I consider that sort of the ideal design of a intersection and I'm very hopeful that they don't try to destroy that with a traffic circle because I, I feel that one is a very safe, uh, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it or something. Whereas maybe the others, I think the one, the main street uh, and, and East Street intersection is is a real concern. And so uh, I would encourage anybody who has thoughts like on how to make it safer for bicycles or anything else uh, to uh, chat either with your representative or send uh, letters to the TSO committee of the council. So that's my thoughts on that one. <laughs> And also, mm -hmm. then uh, I could say that it was my understanding from last night's uh, District 5 meeting that the waste hauler um, RFP has not yet gone out, that they were planning to hire a consultant to prepare the RFP. Uh, that was what I understood, so don't know if it's correct. But if if so... You know, then you know the ECAC could consider whether you have any specific points that really ought to be considered. Any any things that re that you feel really honestly ought to be in the contract or um, 
you know, if, if so, or, or certain questions that you feel would be important for the review, you know, general things like that, it might be appropriate to um, prepare those now. So, okay, thank you. Thanks, Martha, as always. Any other comments? I was just looking back at the draft letter and we could wordsmith it a bit, but I think it probably says what it needs to say and look at the idea if the RFP has not gone out yet. You, you might be right about that, Martha. It was not completely clear from Liz's uh, presentation, uh, um, Lynn's presentation rather, to district, whatever district I'm in, district two, I forget. Um, any other comments? If not, I think we can adjourn this meeting. Should probably make a motion. Oh, oh yeah. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. Andrew, second. Next, seconded. All right. I'll see you next two weeks. Bye, all. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye.